It's Capital Region Sports Saturday with Brady Farkas, sponsored by Mohawk Honda. Capital Region Sports Saturday right here, 104.5 The Team, 104.5theteam.com. Met fans rejoice. Here's how it sounded last night. Swing and a chopper right side. Familia off the mound, has it, sprints to the bag, put it in the books. Put it in the books indeed. The Mets take game one of the National League Division Series. They beat the Dodgers on the road at Chavez Ravine by a score of 3-1. to one. The story of the night, Jacob deGrom, the young flamethrower, the hair and the heat, 13 strikeouts across seven scoreless innings. Jacob DeGrom was indeed DeGromment last night, and the Mets are off and running here in the National League playoffs. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. I am your host, Brady Farkas. Jacob DeGrom, how did he do it last night? Well, he did it with heat, heat, and more heat, and he had Don Mattingly, the Dodgers skipper, recognizing that as well. Pretty good. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of... Uh... Just velocity, just seemed like he beat us with that a lot. Well, that's because he did, Don. Set more than 70 fastballs thrown yesterday by DeGrom. Only two. Only two fastballs thrown under 95 miles an hour from the Mets flamethrower last night. He was seventh among starting pitchers in average fastball velocity all year, right at exactly 95. And when he needed the heat yesterday, DeGrom was able to. To even take it to another level, he was able to hit as high as 99 miles an hour on the radar gun. He really wasn't even in that much trouble all game. He got around a, a misplay early in the game by Michael Kadire, which allowed uh, a, a man to get to second base. And then in the fourth, he got around two singles. And Clayton Kershaw, who almost took DeGrom to the gap for a double, but it was flagged down in left center by Ioannis Cespedes. So DeGrom, after that fourth inning, really wasn't tested. And the Mets... They get they do they do what they do. They pitch well and they get just enough offense. They score on a home run from Daniel Murphy. They get a two run single in the seventh inning by David Wright. The Mets beat Clayton Kershaw, and and the story of the night is not Clayton Kershaw loses in the playoffs again because Clayton Kershaw was unreal last night as well. This was just a pitching matchup between two great pitchers who were out there doing their thing to the best of their ability and doing it well. 13 strikeouts for DeGrom, 11 for Kershaw. I am not putting this loss on Clayton Kershaw, and I'm not going to go into this and say, oh, Clayton Kershaw blew it, and that's why the Mets won. No, the Mets won because Jacob DeGrom was the best we have ever seen him last night. 13 strikeouts for DeGrom he threw well over 100 pitches he he battled late into the game Terry Collins had confidence in him Jacob DeGrom was he was a game one frontline starter and for anyone who was doubting the fact of wow we'd really love to have seen Matt Harvey throw game one would have been a great choice but Jacob DeGrom is the guy that's why he was the National League Rookie of the Year last year he's been trending up towards this he earned it and the Mets are now sitting pretty here at a one game to nothing lead in the NLDS, they stole a game on the road. That's all you can ask for is to come out as the road team and win at least one on the road. But when you go out and beat one of the four, you know, one of the top four pitchers in all of baseball, and he's widely regarded as the best pitcher in baseball, when you go out and beat Clayton Kershaw on the road, you're sitting pretty now. They have a tough task tonight. They'll take on Zach Granke as well. But for the New York Metropolitans, it, it, it can't get much better than that. Relive it again one more time, Met fan. Swing and a chopper right side. Familia off the mound, has it, sprints to the bag, put it in the books. Put it in the books. Jerry's Familia, the save, and, and good for, for him to get some postseason, uh, you know, postseason experience, get potential jitters out. That can only help the Mets as they go forward. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda. Well, it's playoff baseball season. It's also hockey season which kind of snuck up on everybody doesn't feel like hockey season the nhl started earlier this week the rangers off to a 2-0 start but here locally the albany devils dropped the puck tonight for the first time they're traveling out to binghamton we've got devils broadcaster josh heller on the phone with us here on capital region sports saturday josh hockey season where did it all come from 
you know what? You're absolutely right. But uh, I'll tell you what. I got up this morning. It was cold. It was dark. And if it's going to be cold, dark, and snowy and miserable, we might as well have hockey. Josh, the Devils' season starts today. They're on the road at Binghamton. Is this team ready? I, I think they are. I'm not sure I am ready to go. But uh, I, I think the team is. You know, they had uh, development camp middle of the summer. Uh, followed by, you know, uh, training camp. They had the rookies out early in a, in a rookie tournament out in Buffalo. And uh, I, I think most of them are, are kind of chomping at the bit. I know, uh, I know I am. Josh, you've been around the team as they've reported. Who are the guys that we as fans are going to get to know this winter? Well, you know, we had Paul Thompson, who, who you know absolutely exploded on the scene last year, uh, 33 goals. That was a record uh, here in Albany, uh, 22 assists for 55 points. So hoping he has a uh, he has a strong season once again. But you start to look at some of the younger guys, uh, a guy like Joe Blandese, uh played with Barry in the OHL last year as an overager. In fact, was named the overage player of the year in the OHL. He had 52 goals, 60 assists, 112 points. And uh, and I'll tell you what, I've been watching him in practice. He is, he is something special to see as well. So we'll definitely keep an eye on him. Uh, you know, uh, a guy like Blake Coleman out of uh, Miami University, he had a 20-goal season last year for Miami. Ryan Kuchawinski had a total of 34 goals last year between Kingston and North Bay in the OHL. And, and, and then, I mean, you, you, we saw in a short span Matt Laredo last year. He played at Brown. Uh, had a good season at Brown last year and then came to Albany as, a, as an amateur tryout, an ATO, and in 11 games, three goals, nine assists. He really burst on the scene, so hoping to see more of that. And, and don't forget, Max Novak out of a, a Union, uh, 35 games with Union last year, 10 goals, 18 assists. He also scored the game-winning goal in the NCAA Finals, and, uh, you know, he's looking to have a, a strong rookie campaign as well. So, you know, some, some younger guys on this team that really have a chance to, uh, to put their stamp on, uh, on this club and on this season. Josh Heller, Albany Devils broadcaster with us. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. Josh, a new look for the Devils, but not only just a new look for the Devils, a new look for the AHL as a lot of teams have moved from the east out west. Does that change things for the Devils this season? You know, it's not going to change too, too much from Albany's standpoint. The division changes a little bit. You get a couple teams that were Western teams uh, becoming Eastern Conference teams like Utica, even though I don't know why they were ever in the Western Conference. Me either. But, uh, a team like Utica, so we play them eight times this year as opposed to the only you know two times we played them last year. So that's that's a fun rivalry there. That's a, that's a great uh, uh, a great time between those two teams. Rochester coming from the Western Conference, moving to the Eastern Conference, and same with Toronto. And we're in the same division uh, as those teams, so we'll see a lot of those uh, to go along with the other teams in New York and Binghamton uh, and Syracuse. And and again, well, you know, you're also going to see uh, St. John's, and we've seen a few more times. And so for us, it's not a major, major difference, but you start looking at the teams that are out in that new Pacific Division, Bakersfield, California, Ontario, California, San Jose, San Diego, uh, Stockton, California. Those teams, I'm fascinated to see what they're going to do and how they're going to react to being out there. They actually, those five teams, part of the... The deal is they're not going to play as many games as everyone else because of travel restrictions. Uh, so it, it, they're kind of changing how teams are going to be ranked in the standings. It's not just going to be points. It's going to be on point percentage because there are five teams that are playing fewer games than everyone else. It's a very weird dynamic. And uh, it's, this, is a, this is a big year to see how you know, the, the Western migration will really take, uh, take form. Yeah, that is fascinating. I've never heard that before in, a, in at the professional ranks for sure. So, Josh, the opener today, the first home game at the Times Union Center is October 24th. How ready are the Devils going to be to get back after two weeks on the road? Oh, I think they'll be chomping at the bit to get home. You know what? I don't mind starting on the road and, and getting that trip up to Toronto, get the guys together a little bit. You know, on the road, you, uh, you're all eating together. Everyone's rooming together. You know, you're up and practicing. So it's, it, it's a good time to, you know, to spend some time and, and, uh, and bond a little bit. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's four straight games on the road before finally returning home. And, uh, and I, I think on, on the 24th, it's a, it's a 505 game. Should have a great crowd here at the, at the TU Center. And uh, it, it, it should be a fun one. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the environment and, uh, and, and to the results of that one. Josh Heller, Devils broadcaster with us. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda and 104.5 The Team. Here at 104.5 The Team, we are your home of select Devils games throughout the season. So, Josh, we're going to be hearing you all season long. Best of luck. We'll talk to you soon. Oh, Brady, appreciate it. Thank you. Josh Heller, there he goes. Devils open today at Binghamton. First home game, October 24th. Devils failed to make the playoffs a year ago, looking for a bounce-back season this year. Uh, cannot believe that it's hockey season 
already. High school football last night. That I can believe. Big games all around yesterday. Schuylerville Glens Falls was billed as the game of the week, the Class B showdown, and Schuylerville runs away with it 33 to nothing. The Black Horses rush for more than 400 total yards out of that flex bow and offense. Big play of the night, I, in my opinion, really came right before the end of the first half. Schuylerville was already up 20 to nothing. Glens Falls was driving, put together a nice drive, trying to come down and get some points. An interception on a seam route that was deep across the middle. It was picked by Schuylerville right in front of the goal line, and that's how the first half ended, and that really kind of cemented uh, things for the Black Horses. They came out in the second half, and they added on 13 more points. They win it 33 to nothing. Schuylerville certainly looking to be very, very powerful in Class B. Another team powerful in Class B is Shalmont. They had a win over Lansingburg yesterday. Score was 40 to 15. The big story in that one, Jake Dafayette. Jake Defiat, rather, and Cameron Brooks, each more than 100 total yards rushing as, as the Sabres continue to just dominate Section 2 year in and year out. We got an email on Thursday from you, Albany, said they were about to make a big announcement. Well, they weren't lying. I'll tell you about it next. Capital Region Sports Saturday with Brady Farkas, sponsored by Mohawk Honda. So you, Albany on Thursday gets a $10 million, $10 million donation to athletics. Armin and I are, are, are talking on Thursday afternoon. We get an email. You Albany set to make a big announcement. I'm not quite sure what it is. $10 million going to you Albany athletics. It comes courtesy of the Bernard and Millie children's foundation. And, and basically what's going to happen is this is going to go to fund the football stadium and other athletic related uh, other athletic related needs, other athletic related initiatives. So what you're going to see is now the football field will be called Bob Ford Field at KC Stadium. That's the semantics of it. What impact does this have at you, Albany? It's huge. It's huge. I know what you're saying, Brady. How can a how how can facilities make the program? Well, in a word or in a phrase. Facilities have everything to do with building up your program. For for a lot of reasons, this could totally transform you, Albany, from a mid-major player to just a true mid-major power. Okay, to a true mid-major power. Look at football first and foremost. Okay, a a a the, Bob Ford Field is already one of the top FCS facilities in the nation. So any updates to that, now you make it more appealing to recruits. When recruits come up and they see that you're playing at a top flight facility that's better than the facilities in your conference, better than the facilities they've seen nationally, that will help attract a different brand of player to the University of Albany. It's going to help impress the parents of those recruits that are about to send their kids off to college to play at the University of Albany. Wow, I can see myself coming to a game here on Saturday afternoon. I can see myself coming up to five games on a fall or in a fall here on Saturday afternoons. This is a great place for my kid to go. A different brand of recruit can now come to you Albany with more updated facilities. It's going to help the fan experience. It's going to help the fan experience and people don't realize just how big that is. College kid gets up on Saturday morning right now. Okay. Today it's 48 degrees when I wake up this morning. College kid wakes up, say they wake up at 10 a.m. and it's 51 and windy, it's cloudy, it's the middle of November. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit in my dorm room or I'm going to go watch the college football game? Well, you know what? If I had a top flight facility, now maybe I'm more inclined to go watch these games. You Albany wasn't even in the top 30 of SCS football attendance a season ago. New coach, great field, more optimism in the program than ever before. New conference, they weren't even in the top 30 in the FCS in attendance. Now maybe they jump up into that and they get their student body more engaged. You Albany basketball, men's basketball has been to the NCAA tournament three consecutive seasons. Have a very realistic chance to go for a fourth year this year. They're not even in the top 100 nationally in average attendance per home game. The America East Conference is 28th out of 32 in attendance. So if you look at if any of this money goes towards updating the gym, or updating SEFQ Arena or making it a better fan experience, you're going to start to put those people 
in the seats because right now you Albany's got a great athletic program and not enough people know it. This ten million dollar gift, this ten million dollar gift is going to go a huge way towards making putting you Albany on the map here locally, continuing to put it on the map here locally, but also regionally and nationally as they go out to recruit and they go out to draw out a fan base. This is this is a huge deal. You Albany Athletic Director Mark Benson said earlier this week, this transformational gift will enable us to improve the student athletic exper- the student athlete experience for many years to come. The Casey and Duker families who donated the money, they share our vision for the future of our athletic program, and we offer our heartfelt thanks and gratitude for their generosity and value commitment to the university. And now, as teams are able to get better and better by, you know, teams are going to get better and better because of these updated facilities and this, these better programs that are being continued to build up. Well, now you also build a strong alumni support. Okay, because teams that have been very successful are going to follow the team after they've left, and then when they're in a position to donate, maybe you do, maybe they're able to do that as well. And you Albany is able to put this kind of kind of get this uh, this ball rolling when it comes towards just constantly keeping their facilities and their athletic program up to date. If you Albany football wants to get to the same level as a James Madison, as a Delaware, as a Villanova, well, having great facilities that'll get you a long way. If you Albany basketball wants to become the the Creighton of the mid-major world, the Davidson, the Gonzaga of the mid-major world, then these updated facilities and this commitment to athletics by the university and this gift are going to go a long way. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. I'm your host, Brady Farkas. We do this every Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m. right here on 104.5 The Team and 104.5theteam.com. New York Yankees, their season ends earlier this week. And I know what you're thinking, Yankee fans. I know exactly what you're thinking. Buster Olney, he told our own Armin Levac earlier this week, if the Yankees don't win a championship, it's regarded as a failure. Uh, well, I mean, here's the reality. When you have an organization that's won 27 world championships, even though George Steinbrenner isn't around, the Steinbrenner doctrine will forever remain. And Levac knows this in his heart. If you have a season in which you do not win the World Series, uh, especially a year in which you reach the postseason and win the World Series, it's regarded as a failure. Uh, that was absolutely the way it was under George Steinbrenner. And it would be the way it is because I think the fans have essentially taken that on as their doctrine. And- the fans have taken that on as their doctrine. And I'm telling you, I'm here to tell you, that Yankee fan, this season was an immense success. This season was an immense success. Remember back in March when we had questions? How are the Yankees going to deal with the Alex Rodriguez saga? Is he going to break down a month into the season? He had 30, 30 plus, 33 home runs, 151 games he played. They got through that, and Alex Rodriguez excelled. Say what you want about Alex Rodriguez, the person, but Alex Rodriguez, the player, is a major reason why the Yankees did what they did. Is one of the reasons why this season was a success. The Yankees dealt with injuries to their entire starting rotation. Okay, their entire starting rotation w- was banged up at some point th- throughout the year. They missed Masahiro Tanaka in the middle of the season. We had questions about his elbow even coming into the season. They missed Michael Pineda on the DL for a portion of the season. Nathan Eovaldi, they missed him at the end of the year in this playoff run as they tried to chase the AL East. He had double-digit wins for them, was throwing 97 miles an hour on every single pitch. He was gone. CC Sabathia, before he left, before the playoff game to go into alcohol rehab, they missed him on the DL in August, thought maybe his season was over. What team is able to overcome those kind of losses? I know. If you don't win the World Series, Yankee fan, it seems like a failure. But bottom line, you have to appreciate the opportunity to have even been in the playoffs and regard this as a success. It's it, it's unbelievable that we're talking about this Yankee year as a failure. They dealt with the loss of Mark Teixeira. They lost him. Some people predicted it, that, that they would. It's inevitable. But he was having an MVP-type year, 31 home runs through 111 games. 31 home runs through 111 games, they lost him. What team can overcome that? The Yankees did. The Yankees got to the playoffs. I know they didn't win the World Series. They lost to the Astros in the wild card game, but they were in the AL East division race until the last week and a half of the season. 
Buster Olney also spoke to Armin Levac. He did provide the voice of reason that I'm looking for. It was definitely a year of progress for the organization. Their farm system's getting better. They held on to their prospects. They're another year closer to some of these onerous contracts coming off the books. And you know what? They're going to be a better team next year. Yes. Yes. Thank you. The first cut I provided was Buster talking from the Yankee fans' perspective. The second cut was Buster talking from the voice of reason. Buster Olney nailed it right there. You got to see. You got to get to the playoffs and get on-the-job training for Greg Bird, for Luis Severino, for Rob Ref Snyder. The youth movement for New York, it's coming. It's here. All right, these guys are significant pieces to the Yankees' future. And as guys like A-Rod, like Sabathia, like Teixeira, like Carlos Beltran, as those contracts start to come off the books, you're left with these young pieces that now have real-life game experience at the major league level for, for a month plus in meaningful playoff races. And these guys all contributed. They all helped. The New York Yankees are going to be good in the future. And this year was an immense success for them. And to regard it as anything else I, is a mistake. To regard it as anything else is a mistake. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. Dion Lewis set to take the field tomorrow for the Patriots as New England goes on to take the Cowboys. And when he takes the field, he's going to do so with a brand spanking new contract. The Albany native the Albany Academy product, a two-year extension worth potentially $5 million in incentives. He's going to play for the Patriots for another two years beyond this one. And he this solidifies his role. If you were worried that LeGarrette Blunt coming back from suspension was going to start to weed out Deion Lewis, have no fears, no more. Deion Lewis will continue to excel in that New England system for a number of reasons. One, He's not afraid to run between the tackles when he's giving carries to go up the middle. That will still be Blunt's primary job, but Deion Lewis can do that. He can get, he can use that speed and that agility to get to the edge and, be, can, and can become continue to be part of the run game that way as these offenses continue to, to morph. And Tom Brady loves his backs out of the backfield, and so does Bill Belichick. The Patriots organization is notorious to do a great job, a great job in getting their running backs out of the backfield. Remember Shane Vereen, now a giant, double-digit catches last year in the Super Bowl. 45 catches or more in two of three full seasons in New England. That's Deion Lewis's role now, and it's a valuable one. It's a valuable one. Remember Kevin Falk? He had eight seasons or more of at least 30 catches in New England. Tom Brady loves to be a quick hitter. You don't see the Patriots throw the ball deep very much. They throw the ball check down. It's not because Tom Brady doesn't have the arm. But because they figured out, the Patriots figure out, look, one, we keep Tom Brady protected by getting the ball out of his hands early. So we'll get it to a guy who's four or five yards down the field, and we'll get the ball in the hands of our playmakers. Deion Lewis is a playmaker, and he has been a playmaker for the Patriots this season. Again, $5 million potential contract with incentives. He's going to get nearly just about three in guaranteed money by the time this is all said and done. And Deion Lewis said that, hey, they showed faith in him, so he wanted to show it back. Remember, Deion Lewis signed a futures contract in January, and what that meant was that he signed on January 2nd, or January 1st, January 2nd, right after New Year's, and that meant that he could join the team in off-season activities and preparation for this season, but he was not eligible to play in last season, to be around the team last season as they made their Super Bowl, as they made their Super Bowl run. So Deion Lewis, now a, a valued member of the Patriots, and his role solidified for the next two years he is uh one of the number one backs one of the number one pieces in new england as they continue their undefeated start to the 2015 season Dion lewis one of the number one pieces mohawk honda always looking to be number one they strive for perfection every day we're providing the most impeccable customer service is the key to any success and mohawk honda they try to do things right all the time for their family of customers yes they've got over 1,000 new and pre-owned vehicles available to select from Yes, they're open extended hours in each of their departments to better service you. You can shop 10 acres, more than 10 acres of savings opportunities, or you can go online 24-7 at mohawkhonda.com, and they will provide you the lowest no-hassle prices to suit your budget. At Mohawk Honda, they've got more than 180 trained automotive experts going above and beyond to make sure all of your needs are met. 
You can ask their Mohawk Honda Exchange specialists about their Mohawk Honda Exchange program. They'll upgrade your current vehicle to a newer one with no money down for the same or lower payment. Please ask for Tiffany, Katie, or V-Day to see just how easy it is to exchange your vehicle for the same or lower payment. So you can shop their convenient Route 50 in Glenville location to join the number one automotive family at Mohawk Honda, where they always go out of their way to please you. From walk-on to team captain, that's the case for this U Albany basketball player. It's a great story, and he joins us next. It's Capital Region Sports Saturday with Brady Farkas, sponsored by Mohawk Honda. Welcome back. On the phone with us now, U Albany men's basketball player Reese Williams. Reese Williams named one of three team captains earlier this week by Will Brown. He joins Peter Hooley and Ray Sanders, but this is a great story. Reese, you're a walk-on. Now you're the team captain. Congratulations on the honor. What was your reaction when you found out the news? You know, I was, uh, it was uh, like, like you said, it was it's definitely an honor uh, to be considered and then to be you know, thought highly enough by uh, first my teammates and my coach as well. Uh, so, you know, it was just, I just felt, you know, really, really uh, blessed and honored to be, uh, to be considered. Ultimately, being a captain comes down to trust from your teammates and your coaching staff. What does it say to you about the trust that, that those guys have in you? I think, it, you know, obviously being a walk-on, you know, not being a scholarship player, I think that it just, it just shows that, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I really try to, you know, continue to be a leader, you know, even, even from my position. And, uh, you know, it just, it just feels good to see that my teammates have realized that and, and that my coaches realize that makes me feel like I'm doing something all right. Reese, I was a college baseball player. I was a pitcher. I know how hard it is to try to lead guys every single day when you're not in the lineup every day, when you're not playing every day. You as a guy who hadn't seen a ton of playing time in your previous three years here, I think that's even more of a testament to you and how much these guys believe in you. What is it that you're bringing to the table day in and day out, aside from just a contribution on the floor? I, I think it, I mean, I think it's the leadership thing. And Coach Brown had told me, you know, he, 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 he told me in the past that he thought, you know, he respected my, my leadership. It's really kind of a commitment to yourself. You know, you kind of say, hey, you know, I'm, even though I'm not playing so much, am I going to uh, continue to represent myself well by doing things the right way? And, I, and I, I really tried hard to continue to do that. And it just, you know, it shows, you know, in Coach Brown's trust in me to name me as a leader and uh, a captain. And, you know, my teammates as well to vote me in as well. I've heard Coach Brown say, time and again that that you've had that you had options coming out of high school you could have gone to a division three school and probably starred you could have gone to a division two school maybe even another division one school and seen significant playing time what was it about you albany that brought you here first off i, I liked I, I really i did like the school when i came to visit it um as a senior in high school and you know to be honest i really wanted to play division one basketball and, and i thought uh you know this would be the best opportunity for me to do that you know the other division one schools some of them had a had an invited walk on uh position and but they were a bit more expensive than the Albany was and then you know some of the division three schools i just didn't you know uh want to limit myself to just coming out and saying hey i'm going to jump straight to division three and i wanted to give this a shot and i'm glad i did you know you've been to three consecutive ncaa tournaments what has that experience been like for you i mean really can't ask for much more as a division one <laughs> athlete right right no it's 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 unreal when you think about it uh, I remember the first one that we went to. I remember the first time we beat Vermont up in Vermont to go to the tournament, and I it, it was like a momentary reflection of, wow, you know, we spent however many days in practice just for this moment, and here it is right now, and it was like it was it was it was surreal. I think you have a special vantage point on this because you see him in the games, but you also probably go against him in practice. Just how good is Evan Singletary, your guys' point guard? Uh, <laughs> Evan is, 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 is definitely one of the best players I ever played against off uh, the dribble. Uh, there's times in, in, in pickup and in, in practice where you think, you know, I'm just going to stick with him, and uh, he just pulls up and hits a shot, like much like the shot that he, the shot that he hit to win the game in Vermont last year. And it's just like I was in his face. How did he hit that shot? But uh, he, he's definitely tough, and uh, he's, got, he's got a long way ahead of him. You Albany men's basketball player Reese Williams with us. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda. Reese, we can't talk you Albany basketball without our obligatory Joe Cremo of Scotia question. We talked to Peter Hooley last week, and, and he told us just how hard Joe is working. You as a mentor to younger players, do you ever have to tell Joe to cool it a little bit? <laughs> no, you know, honestly, I, I mean, they, they said it. Joe is in the gym probably every day. I know he still wakes up at 6, and the, uh, but it, it's hard for me to tell a guy – you know, hey, you gotta you gotta turn it down a little bit because I know that you know I know that grind. I know coming into school thinking that you've got you know something to prove, 
and uh, getting up every day and going ahead and working out, you know, even though you have practice later that day. So I, it's, it's hard for me to tell Joe, hey, back off a little bit. You know, I think he's going to kind of come to that realization on his own about how much he needs to do and when he needs to do it. Um, but I, I, it's hard for me to tell him, you know, hey, uh, cool it down a little bit, you know. At the end of the day, I think one of the best legacies that you can have as a senior is to say that you're leaving the program on a better note than than when you found it. How true is that for you guys at, at U Albany? What are the differences now between being in the Great Danes program as you get ready to leave it versus when you came in as a freshman four years ago? I think the team is uh, is closer as a whole. You know, when I came in, uh, there was a, it was a good number of seniors that were graduating that year. You know, some guys who had been through some seasons that weren't so great. And uh, that made them really, really close. So it may have been a little harder for the new guys to penetrate that circle. Um, but now I think it's 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 a it's a closer team. I, I do think that it's a maybe a well more well well rounded team. A lot of the new guys that came in this year it was a very competitive off season. When we played pick up, I can't remember a day where it wasn't competitive. Where guys weren't you know maybe shoving someone after a, a, a tough bucket, you know, or, or talking some trash. It was not a day that I can remember that that didn't happen. And uh, you know. That's a good thing, you know, it, because it, it stayed on the court, it didn't travel into the locker room, and uh, I think that's one of the uh, major differences. But it, it's definitely a more competitive team, one through fifteen or one through fourteen, compared to when we, when I first came in. You guys are going to Rupp Arena on November sixteenth. They're going to open up your season at Kentucky. How excited are uh, How excited are you? Probably as a basketball fan, just to be playing at Rupp Arena. How cool is that? Oh man, I'm I'm excited, you know, and I I want to. Uh, I want to. I want to see. You know, I, I want an upset. You know, it's not. It's not so much the excitement of hey, we're going to play Kentucky, but we're going to go there and we're going to. You know, we're going to work hard until that day, and then we're going to give it our best shot. And then, you know, I, I I think we have as good a shot as anybody else in the country as far as you know that first game of the season being Kentucky. Reese Williams, you Albany men's basketball player, with us on Capital Region Sports Saturday. Reese, congratulations again on the honor of being named one of three team captains this year. We cannot wait for basketball season to officially start on November 13th when you guys take off Kentucky. Best of luck this season. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, what a great story. Reese Williams, one of three team captains. And, and yeah, that game is November 13th, Friday, November 13th. It's U Albany at Kentucky. I think I'd said 16th uh, earl- earlier in the interview. So November 13th, U Albany basketball opens up their season against Kentucky at Rupp Arena. And, again, a great story, a true testament to hard work and perseverance. And and that goes to show you that even if you're not always contributing on the floor, you can find ways to contribute uh, in, into a major college program. So so good for Reese Williams. We'll definitely keep tabs on him. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda. The Mets, they beat the Dodgers yesterday 3-1. to one. They're up one game to none in the National League Division Series. The big blow last night came from who else? The captain. Swinging a shot towards center. Base hit, David Wright. Two runs are going to score. Granderson races to third. He's there. Mets three. And the Dodgers nothing. David Wright pounds a fastball up the middle. And the New York Mets have three runs in. And the game started by Clayton Kershaw. Clayton Kershaw had left the game at that point right before Wright's at bat. It was one to nothing. Mets. Kershaw leaves with the bases loaded. Uh, Dodgers go to the bullpen and Wright hits a 3-2 fastball right up the middle. Two-run RBI single. The Mets steal game one against arguably the best pitcher in baseball. They are in a great spot going into tonight's game two. Keys for tonight. The Mets have to go for the jugular. Go for it. They're going up against Zach Granke. It's no easier than last night. Granke, in my opinion, he's a National League Cy Young winner. 19-3, 1.66 ERA. 19-3, 1.66 ERA. If the Mets are going to beat Granke, you've got to take advantage of every single opportunity that you have to score. So if the Mets, if they need to run, if they need to bunch, if they need to play small ball early, do it. Try to get a run on the board early and then go and trust Noah Syndergaard, put, take the pressure off the rookie, and that will help him, and it will give you the confidence to know that you can get a lead against Granke. Don't wait around until the seventh inning and try to come back. Don't keep it 0-0 into the seventh. Don't play safe. The Mets have already stolen a game. Okay, if they don't win tonight, they're still in a great position. They, they, to have a chance to win, they needed to be one of Granky or Kershaw. They've already done that. So go out tonight and play loose, play fearless, and go for the jugular early when you can. Try to score early. Do whatever you can. Great for David Wright last night. The, Yank, or the uh, Mets middle of the order was big last night. They got the two-run single from Wright. They got a home run from Daniel Murphy. They'll need that lineup to continue to be long tonight so that Granky can't just pitch around 
the middle of the order. They need that whole lineup to be long. They need to lengthen it out, and they need to try to get to Granke's pitch count and hopefully get him out of the game early. But, again, they need to be aggressive enough that if they have a chance to score, they go ahead and take it. Last key tonight, the Mets need. They need help from their mid-relief. That was the only blemish yesterday. Dodgers scored one one run. It came off Tyler Clipper, the guy that got uh, right around the trade deadline. He's been, you know, he's been good for the Mets, but the Mets' mid-relief has been an issue all season. The bridge between that great starting pitching and Juris Familia at the back end of that bullpen. So they need those mid guys, those guys that can take it from potentially the sixth to the eighth. They need them to be really good. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda. Biggest game on the high school docket yesterday was supposed to be Schuylerville and Glens Falls. That was 33-0 Black Horses. It turned out to be Saratoga and CBA. The Blue Streaks, arguably the best team in the area. They've been rolling through everybody. Well, they have to come from behind yesterday to beat the brothers. They do so 25-24. to So fourth down, two minutes, 30 seconds to play. Saratoga's Brian Williams completes a 46-yard pass to set up a first down in the red zone. That keeps Saratoga in the game. They eventually punch it in with a minute 23 to play, and Saratoga converted on five fourth downs and scored three touchdowns. Five fourth down conversions. Three of them were touchdowns yesterday, and, and, and Saratoga, they, they remain unbeaten, but if you're CBA, you've got to be sick about how that game ended. A, a really tough loss for the brothers, but for Saratoga, the best just keep on clicking. Yankee fans, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I'll tell you why next. It's Capital Region Sports Saturday with Brady Farkas, sponsored by Mohawk Honda. So the Yankee season comes to an end earlier this week. They lose in the one-game playoff to the Houston Astros that game at Yankee Stadium. And late in the game, Brett Gardner gets out. Brett Gardner was 0 for 4 with three strikeouts. And Yankee fans started booing him. They started booing him. They started booing the team. And for me, watching that game at home, I'm not a Yankee fan, but watching that game at home, that's downright embarrassing, Yankee fans. Brett Gardner, Brett Gardner does not deserve to be booed. Brett Gardner played 151 games for you this year. He had 16 home runs. He had almost 70 RBIs. He stole 20 bases. He is one of the main reasons you got to the playoffs. And to go and turn on him just because it's a one-game playoff was downright wrong. Was downright wrong. Brett Gardner is one of the main reasons why you got there. Brett Gardner, he plays hard. He's not a guy who's about the money. You see him, he's a grinder. He's a, he's a dirt bag on the field. You know, he's always dirty. He's diving. He slides head first. He plays through injury. Brett Gardner is now the face of your franchise. When Derek Jeter left, Brett Gardner is the guy who filled that role. He, if there was a team captain after Derek Jeter, it would be Brett Gardner. Yankee fans, to crush him like that in that moment was wrong. To crush the team was wrong. And, look, I wrote about this at 1045theteam.com this way, this week, and, and a lot of people, they voiced their, their opinion against me. And that's fine, but let, let's see here. We got one, Jack Mincer. Farkas, he's hardly a major commentator. Well, maybe. If the fans don't boo, then this team, this coach, and this ownership will think it's okay to perform the way they did that night. Really? Really? If the Yankee ownership thought it was okay to go out and lose, would they have invested all the money they have invested in Alex Rodriguez, CeCe Sabathia, Mark Teixeira, Carlos Beltran, Jacoby Ellsbury, Brian McCann, in the past, Gary Sheffield, Bobby Abreu, Jason Giambi, Roger Clemens, if the Yankee ownership thought it was okay to lose, would they really, uh, you know, if the Yankee ownership thought it was okay to lose, I, I, that's just not going to happen. So Yankee ownership does not think it's okay to lose if the fans don't boo. That has The, the fans booing will not make the Yankee ownership act any differently. The Yankee ownership goes out to put the best product on the field every single year, and that's why they try to buy all these players. That's why the Yankee fans, that's why the Yankees don't, retool they just reload and they go out and try to make a quick fix for everything so yankee ownership is not going to be persuaded by you booing yankee fans paid i know another one yankee fans we paid 200 dollars a seat for these seats we have every right to be displ to, to be displeased eh, maybe maybe but the yankees in turn as i just said 
They've gone out and bought, brought in all of these players, all these big money guys, to make it an enjoyable experience for you, the fan, because they know you're paying a lot of money. So they've tried to deliver the best product. So once more, that that argument doesn't it doesn't work for me. Yankee fans are supposed to be respected and classy and always behind their team. They can get on other guys, they get on other teams, other fan bases, but they've always stayed true to themselves and believing in their own team. And Yankee fans, they turned on them. They turned on their own team in that one game playoff, and that. That was embarrassing. The Yankees were lucky to be there. They overcame injury all year. Tanaka, Pineda, Ellsbury, Sabathia, Teixeira. They dealt with the loss of Derek Jeter. They dealt with the Alex Rodriguez saga. They played prospects at the end of the season in pennant races. They lost the Evaldi to injury. The Yankees were lucky to be there. Daniel Mahoney writes... Farkas says they're lucky to be there. Really? Well, what does that say about a team with a payroll likely double that of the Astros? The Yankees are what's wrong with baseball, and their greed is nullified home field advantage. So he kind of contradicted himself there. It doesn't matter that the Yankees have double the payroll of the Astros. They were missing key guys all throughout the season. If they were, if they had had their full complement of players, maybe they beat the Blue Jays. They're not even in that situation. But the Yankees were a depleted roster at every single point throughout the season. And getting to the playoffs, period, is an accomplishment. And getting a home game in the playoffs is an accomplishment. Bottom line, they were beat by a good pitcher. They were beat by Dallas Keuchel, who's got 23 scoreless innings against them this year because the Yankees don't hit lefties all that well. And Dallas Keuchel changes speed, works quick, is effective with his breaking ball, and that gave the Yankees problems. Yankee fans, I get that you're disappointed. I get that you wanted to win the World Series. I get that you think it's a failure, that you didn't win the World Series. But bottom line is, they were lucky to even be in a position to get to the World Series. Go talk to any number of fan bases. They would have been just thrilled to see, to have the season that the Yankees had and just get to the playoffs. It's It's Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. On the phone with current Utica College quarterback Teddy Van Galen. Van Galen also the former Shen quarterback. Teddy, you guys are taking on Brockport tonight. A big game for you. What are the keys? I think we just got to stay focused. I mean, it's a a night game on the road. Uh, We got to keep our composure, especially with the big win last weekend. Uh, We just got to do what we've been doing all season and uh, hopefully get that win. Your guys' schedule is is unbelievably challenging. You talk about Cortland, you talk about Brockport, St. John Fisher is always nationally ranked, or at least in the conversation. How good is the schedule that you guys are playing week in and week out? Yeah, every week you play a, a, a team that's getting uh, votes for the top 25 or a team that's actually ranked. I mean, even our non-conference games are very tough. So, I mean, if you have a bad week, you could, you could lose any time. It depends if, if what team you're playing. I mean, you could be playing the last team in the conference. And you could have a bad quarter, a bad half, and you, you could end up losing. Teddy, you're throwing for almost 300 yards a game at the college level. You're throwing more than the New York Jets do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's nice coming here, especially from high school. I mean, I didn't throw that much in high school, but you come here, coaches give you a lot of confidence. I mean, you just got to go through your reads, and then uh, the yards come, the stats come. I mean, all that matters is the W's. You're a former Shen player. You've got a couple of Shen guys on the team with you, a couple other guys just from the Capital Region. How cool is that for you to have a little bit of taste of home out there on your college team? Yeah, it's nice having guys from the same area as you. I mean, you can just uh, start conversation with them about our hometown and everything and just blend right in like it's a, like it's another uh, high school team. I mean, especially with uh, Alex Russo. I mean, that, that's big, having a wide receiver from your school play with you in college. I mean, it helps a lot. For you, is there ever any rivalry uh, between you and other Capital Region guys on the team? You know, that, that's one thing that always happened on my college team was, was talking a little trash to other guys from the area. Uh, I mean, it comes up a little bit uh, here and there. I mean, there's a kid on our team from Gildwin. I mean, we talked to him a little bit about that, but uh, it's all good. Uh, all fun and games. I mean, we're on the same team now, so that's all that matters. I played Division Three baseball. I think that people have this assumption that if you're not playing Division One, that – you know, that college sports is just kind of like an extension of high school sports. I don't think people realize just how much work goes into it. Take us through how much work goes into your preparation in the off season, what practice is like, just how, how you know, just how tough it is to make it work at the college level. Yeah, I have a couple kids that play. A couple of my friends played uh, Division One. I. I mean, we work out with them. We do the same things they do in the off season. I mean, even during spring ball, we compare spring balls. We, we're doing the same thing that they are. They just go a little bit earlier. I mean, they get a scholarship and everything. I mean, we work as hard as possible as all these other Division Two, Division One schools, and we just 
don't get scholarships. We just have to work for by uh, in the classroom. We we get academic scholarships. I mean, I think as a Division three athlete, you have to work way harder because you don't get that scholarship to fall back on. You just gotta you gotta work hard in the classroom, and you also gotta focus up to the game that comes every week. Shane graduate Teddy Van Galen, current Utica College quarterback with us, Capital Region Sports Saturday, brought to you by Mohawk Honda. Teddy, your pioneers taking on Brockport tonight. Best of luck, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Teddy Van Galen, current Utica College quarterback with us here, 104.5 The Team, 104.5 The Team.com, the former Shen quarterback. High school football last night, Cambridge in Class D, a win over Chatham. They're now 6-0. and They've outscored their opponents 235 to 72 big performances last night colonies dan care her 29 carries 177 yards in a garnet raiders 28 to 14 win coming up today locally union hockey coach rick bennett goes for his 100th win tonight at the head, at the helm of union as the dutchman take on boston university rpi in action as well they lose their opener last night you Albany football in action today at home at Bob Ford Field. Now Bob Ford Field at KC Stadium. The Danes taking on Maine back in CAA action. Oh, Deion Lewis takes the field tomorrow for the Patriots. Brand new contract. Patriots take on the Cowboys. The Patriots arguably the top team in the NFL. And they've got their, uh, their we've got our Albany product in their backfield. And he's one of the main reasons why they are one of the top products in the NFL or one of the top teams in the NFL. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, where at Mohawk Honda they strive for perfection every day by providing impeccable customer service. They've got more than 1,000 new and pre-owned vehicles to select from. Open extended hours at all of their departments to better service you. You can shop over 10 acres of savings opportunities or go online 24-7 at mohawkhonda.com, and they'll provide you the lowest no-hassle prices to suit your budget being number one isn't easy but at mohawk honda they treat their customers with respect and have been doing so for almost 100 years four generations of the Heriden family serving the capital region shop their convenient route 50 in glenville locations to join the number one automotive family at mohawk honda where they always go out of their way to please you capital region sports saturday will do it again next week 9 to 10 a.m armin and levac back on monday breaking down all the NFL action, breaking down all of the Mets. Mets game two tonight against the Dodgers. That game, 9-15. We'll see you next week.